welcome to the Thursday episode of the 905er and the 905 Roundup. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And it's September the 6th as we record this. It will be September the 8th when you hear this, I suspect. And it's uh, the day that the schools open up again. The kids happily trot off with their... Uh, with their satchels and, and sandals in their school uniforms to uh to eager to begin learning for another if, year if if you didn't if you didn't date yourself as a <laughs> as a brit expat you just did because <laughs> there's there, right now there are a lot of, there are a lot of parents going like I, i've never sat send my kid off with a satchel in my life uh but you're right it, it, it's uh it's back to school season and it's um you know it, it Parents are wondering how is this year going to be different from the previous two, I guess three, I, technically three, I, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, because I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to rehash the last two years because we've all, you know, if you're a parent like I am, you, we all know, we all, we all share the same shame, knowing glance, the knowing glances and this, you know, the, the, the head nods of, of, uh, you know, we've, we've been through some stuff, but, you know, parents are, are concerned about, is this going to be the year that we finally see a full school year uh, back, uh, you know, fr from start to finish, right? Like a, a, a relatively normal school year. And I, for one, want that to be, I, I'm really hoping that, that, that this year is a back to normal year. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for us and my, my fingers are crossed, but there's um, the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because there's a, you know, there's, there's talk, it, it there's just there's this uh, that haze in the in the in the sky that says you know things are not all copacetic first off let's let's talk to or hit the talk about the elephant in the room and that's covid um parents are are there's a concern that schools will be see a spike in covid cases if you're a parent last year you, chances are your school your kid's school saw at some point just massive absences of kids uh because someone in the family or they themselves or somebody got COVID and they had to stay home and just saw like classrooms potentially half empty teachers were sick and they were so there's this you know you didn't even know if your kid's teacher was going to be there for the end of the school year it was a, it's a bit a bit of chaos but we kind of just crept across the finish line barely and the question now is like okay like it, you know how, how are we turning this around the the this government, you know, Stephen Lecce, the Minister of, of Education, sorry, um, is saying no. Come hell or high water, schools will stay open. They are not closing schools for COVID or any other uh, reasons like that. Yet, you have to ask, like, what what happened? What happens if case numbers get up to a point that you know we, we can't ignore it? And I find I find that 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 in itself is a bit telling. I mean, I'm not I'm not advocating well, let's lock down schools. Nobody wants that, but you kind of want to know like. Do you have a plan? Like, is there a plan to, you can say we're going to keep them open no matter what, but is there a plan there? And that's what I think that's where this government is falling short is in that reassurance of, yes, you know, taking out the plan off the shelf, showing it says, read it. This is it. This is what we're going to do. If, uh, if uh, things start to get bad, we see case numbers starting to get up there and, you know, schools become a hotspot. This is what we're going to do. I mean, schools will be a hot spot uh, my understanding is the numbers are already rising uh, i was speaking to someone earlier this evening who's just been exposed to, you know had direct mm -hmm. contact with someone with covid he that person had quite a not not, not a terrible experience first time around but certainly not a pleasant experience mm -hmm. the first time around and it's like oh gee thanks you know uh, here we go again um you know there there were you know, and i don't want to spread rumors but you know there are stories in in seemingly fairly reputable sources about you know people who are catching it for the second or third time and that, that there are sort of cumulative effects or you know there was a story today about uh, effects on brain function and stuff like this but i think we also have to accept well the assholes won uh when it comes to covid 19 um the my knowledge my understanding is that that you know um there's no <laughs> despite all the protests there are no mandates in schools um it was hard enough to keep 
to ask children to keep their masks on, certainly the younger children to keep their masks on, when when it was actually an order that they had to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Now uh, they don't. Uh, my understanding is that the vast, vast majority of children do not and will not be wearing masks of any kind. I think most teachers, if not all teachers, pretty much have had COVID by now at least once. Um, and we're asking them to be on the front line of a kind of medical experiment in a lot of ways. Um, right. Uh, well, you know, but but what are we going to do? It's no one wants to talk about COVID anymore. No one wants to right. stay home anymore. Uh, I suspect they won't close. I mean, you know, they're not going to say it out loud in the way that Boris Johnson did, but basically let the bodies pile up as they may. We're going back to work. Um, mm -hmm. And school, particularly well, the elementary and lowest levels of school, are basically an essential are basically child care for people who who are families which are the vast majority of families right. who who um who uh, both go out to work and, and don't have anybody to look after young children it's 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 that simple um, well here's but here's where i think i think it gets a little bit uh complicated why the government wants to turn away from covid uh, you know a credible covid plan um you know we're, we're so we're, we're going away from COVID, we're, we're trying to get out of it and put it behind us. Whether we'll succeed, history will determine that. Uh, but what we're going into is union uh, union talks. You know, that's what, that's the next thing that we're hearing on the on the horizon is uh, you know QP QP right now is up for uh, up for uh, renegotiation. They're they're at the table saying, okay, this is what we want to see for our members, and this is kind of, you know ever all the other unions in the in the teaching industry uh bad bad choice of words i'm afraid uh but in, in the teaching field all the other unions are kind of looking at them as the first as the first ones into the fray you know how how are, how are their how is their negotiations negotiations going to work out and the entire the eyes of the promise are on this and the reason why i is because you know like what will the the public attitude be towards a strike and i i think Patience is very thin amongst parents and the public at, at large with between all the various lockdowns that have happened. Um, you know, here's the thing, like those lockdowns were a result of Minister Lecce. Like I, I know I remember as a parent at the start of the pandemic and for two years, every time he came on the microphone and he said, oh, we're going to give it, we're going to have an announcement. And every parent stopped what they're doing to tune in. Like, am I gonna? Am my kid gonna be in school tomorrow? Was basically the question that everyone in the province had on their mind, and it was frustrating because nine times out of ten, it was Stephen Lecce going up to the microphone saying, "I have an announcement that I'll be making an announcement tomorrow," and like, really, like, and then people were frustrated and walked away. And I think this government burnt a lot of goodwill amongst parents during the pandemic. Uh, and it still carries over. And all that they want a majority, but I think that's more uh, a failure of the NDP and the uh, Liberal Party to capitalize on that than anything else. But that 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 frustration, that anger, still exists, at least amongst parents. I'm 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 aware of. Now we're going to negotiations, and you know if we can declare essentially COVID is over, no more COVID. That's not an issue. Now we're getting right down to tax dollars to pay. QP, so your janitorial, your secretary, your, your administrative support staff, all those folks that help make a school run. Then after that, teachers uh, as well. If we can start saying, okay, we're going into a, into a negotiation. If they decide to strike, if they don't accept what we give them and your, your kid's school is now closed because of a strike, it's their fault now, not ours. That's what this is about. And I... I don't know if that's going to necessarily fly because I think patience is just fed up and it might be a bit of a pox on both your houses situation from, from the public, mostly because here's the thing you can, you can go to, you know, the right now QP is asking for, I believe 11.7% pay increase uh, for their members. The government is saying, no, you get two, your, your highest paid member gets uh, uh, two, uh, or sorry, your your high, your your lowest paid member gets two percent. Your your highest gets one and a half. That's it. Pay increase. And 
you know, like that's a that's a really tough pill to swallow to say, like, okay, like you know, we're we're saving, like, what are, what are we saving here? You know, what, what, how, how is this going to play out? I don't know. Well, a simple matter is inflation's running at what is inflation running at right now? Ten percent? More than two percent? Well, hell of a lot more than two percent. Yeah. Um, you know, you, yeah. I mean that. So a two percent pay increase is a eight percent pay cut. Uh, I mean, you know, my math oh, isn't good it, enough to do to calculate the exact numbers there. But but it, it, this is a real a real terms cut that's being proposed, and, and you know, the teachers will say that they and and they have a point under this government and previous governments. They they've had seen their salaries whittled away and it may be whittled away from a fairly healthy position but it but um but you know this was always on the cards with this government this this is the teachers and the pc party of ontario are like the coal miners and margaret thatcher in britain you know this uh, this is this is the fight that they want to see happen. Roland, want Roland, you should have picked every <laughs> every high school english teacher's favorite subject shakespeare they're they're the montagues and capulets they <laughs> But you're right. But you see, if want, you remember, they want if you to kill them, that. You they, they want to kill the teachers' unions. Yes. They want to destroy the teachers' unions as 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 a force because they think they're too strong. Because you know, teachers in Ontario, compared with teachers in many other jurisdictions around the world, are not badly off. But hey, look, you look at the statistics, and schools in Ontario have some of the best results in the world. You know, you yep. get what you pay for. Don't, and Ontario teachers are, are pretty damn good as a general rule. Don't for, don't also forget. Prior to the pandemic, or if you flash back to March 2020, it seems a lifetime ago, we had rotating strikes in this province as they were in the midst. Like this isn't new. This isn't a an unreasonable thing. This is back to basics for this government of let's pick a fight with the unions. Prior to the pandemic, our unions were in a fight with the government over pay over the contract that they're currently in, uh, because. And, but they only signed because of the pandemic. The notion was we got it, we just got to solve this thing because we got this pandemic to fight. And everyone said, okay, fine, sign an agreement, take and yeah, we'll walk it's, off. It's, it's, it's a battle postponed yeah. from March 2020. Um, yeah, of course they, they, they want to fight. Um, this is the fight that, the, you know, in so far as the PC, PC government has any principles, it's to stick the boot to its enemies. Yeah. Um, whether those are people in municipalities, whether it's you know personally personal grudges against Patrick Brown or whoever, uh, or the city of Toronto, or uh, or you know above all sticking it to teachers because teachers have unions that are that are have been very effective over the decades uh, at getting good deals for their members, which you know in case we forget is just what unions are supposed to do just like your lawyer is supposed to get you a good deal yeah um when you go to court but um, there's one there's one thing that i think people should keep in mind is there's a the zeit the, the zeitgeist if you will has changed from tw from march of 2020 um post covid post pandemic we're seeing the what you know everyone's reads it in the paper you pick up a paper you read it the great resignation the great you know people are leaving jobs on mass um because of poor working conditions now the i'm not saying we're going to see a mass t uh, teacher shortage i hope not but here's the thing if if this government decides well i'm going to go pick a fight and i'm going to go and get i'm going to give these unions peanuts two percent best i can offer and i'm going to break you to 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 do it there's nothing stopping down the roads, teachers saying, "Well, I'm not getting my fair. I, 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 I know what I'm worth. I know what I know what I want. I'm going to go get it. I'm leaving." And here's the thing: like that's what that's kind of the long term that I'm worried about is if te if the teachers don't they they start to lose that 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 feeling of I'm respected uh, for the job that I'm doing. If it's a matter of like you're paid too much, you know, you work for me and you're paying you too much. Meh. They'll eventually the teachers will just say, I'm not, this isn't worth it. I'm leaving. We see it in the States. We see it like there's massive teacher shortages amongst the states of all those Republican right leaning states that said, oh, we're going to stick it to the teachers because that's going to save us tax dollars. And we're going to, teachers don't deserve to be paid that much. And there's this great, there's race to the bottom in those states 
We're seeing teachers leaving the profession en masse for other jobs uh, or just leaving the state, uh, state in, in question. And schools are finding, well, we don't have enough teachers just to teach basic, you know, math, reading, and 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 uh, and writing at the basic level in our in our school system. Forget the you know the trades programs, the science programs, and the history and art and all that stuff that we want to see in, in schools. They're ba- they're having basic needs not being met. And I you know you say oh I'm, I'm, it's it's, hyper, it's hyperbole Joel is what you're you're shouting into the microphone, maybe, but it starts somewhere. And quite frankly, I'm I'm saying is two percent a little insulting in the face of two, three years of uncertainty being going going into a COVID factory for two years, essentially, a, a, a petri dish, and saying the best I can offer you is two percent. And you say, I'm not saying you have to give them the eleven, but you know, come up me and say, I'll meet you halfway. Can I meet you halfway? And I'd be like, that's a fair deal. That's a that would be a fair a fair offer to uh, to the unions. And if the unions still reject them, like you guys are morons. But coming in 2% is just a slap in the face. And quite frankly, I say, you know what? Fine. Then, you know, give them the finger, throw open the door and say, clean up your own mess. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's like night follows day, conservative government unrest with teachers because yeah. they, they, you know, the, the, people in charge of the education system never used the damn education system i mean True. specifically lecce did not go to a public school i mean it, it but yeah i mean it's the te- teachers were on the front lines of this thing um because you know even if there were times when teaching was being done from home uh, there were also times when it was mixed and some were having to go into work mm-hmm. uh, whether they wanted to or not um and um uh, it yeah that they're, they're part of like i say a kind of medical experiment um you know and yeah eventually they got ppe i believe which is reasonably good but it took a long time uh, to arrive mm-hmm. you know if you're working in a hospital you probably had decent ppe from day one now long-term care different story um but um you know it it All, all the all the uh, professions where people were in those kinds of jobs where they just had to go and be in contact with COVID, uh, whether they liked it or not, um, I think deserve credit and deserve you know leniency right. when it comes to to. Uh, I to look at pay look at this way when in the Second World War, because if I'm going to bring up the Second World War analogy, because if everyone remembers at the start of this pandemic, we were told it's going to be like to defeat. COVID, we're going to have to think like society did in the Second World War. You know, all hands on deck, put all the resources into defeating this virus. And we did. And teachers were a big part of that. Now, if you want to think of teachers and the nurses and, and doctors, they were on the front lines of this uh, pandemic. They were, they were our, our first line of defense. And I think it's a little disheartening that you know, in the Second World War, our veterans came back from that war and we found them college, you know, money for college degrees, money for housing, uh, uh, money to help them start businesses. And we, we found ways to reintegrate them. You know, you, you went off and you, you defeated fascism, you defeated the Nazis, you, you, you won, you secured our freedom. You deserve this. You de- well, we're going to find the money because you deserve this. You, you, you bled and you lost limbs and, and you, you fought for us over there you deserve that while you're here where was that, where's that attitude now for the teachers and the nurses and the doctors who who helped us keep this you know the, our society going and our kid our, gave our kids a, try to make our kids a, a safe place for them to to go and it kind of just like where where is that attitude where, why are we now like let's go pick a fight with them it, it's just yeah, above I, mean, the I, line. I, th- I think to be honest you know if the analogy of this this is the closest thing our generation is going to have to an event like the second world war then we lost the war we quit we gave up we were divided by fifth columnists who went and marched about masks uh we've lost the war covid is here to stay it's not under control it's never going to be controlled probably we're hopefully the 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 
scientists would keep on pumping out the uh, new uh, vaccines, hopefully new vaccines, better vaccines, whatever, uh, to, to keep the thing at a, at a reasonable level. But basically, you know, we're talking about the population as a whole, about our political leadership, you know, exclusive, excluding the scientific part from the equation. We fucked this up from beginning to end. We lost. We capitulated. We were bums. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to pay with a price for the rest of our lives. So, so be it. That's the decision that we made as a society. But yeah, compare us to those people who fought through the Second World War across the well, across the whole planet, and who you know when that war was over said you know never again. We'll have homes built for heroes. We'll have a health system that's decent. We'll make sure that everybody's educated well. You know this is this is out of this horror will come something much better. And I remember us talking about that on, on early episodes of this of the yep. podcast, saying yep. you know, hopefully some good things come from this. Or maybe the work from home thing is, is a benefit you can point to. But yeah, no, maybe. we didn't win this war. We lost it. It's over. We're done. And yeah, yeah. I'm kind of mad. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I am too. And I, I just, I'm, I'm, my guess, a lot of parents are looking at this and we're worried about the year to come. And, um, are we still going to be this disruptive? Like, are we not going to have a, a year of just peace and learning? I don't know. I'm going to leave it at that because I see we're coming up on, a, on our break. Uh, so we're going to take a break and come back with the second half of the episode. Okay, and we're back, folks. Uh, steering clear of our, our, uh, our, our battered school system, uh, Let's take a look at our battered municipal electoral system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We really must try and find a good news story, but you know, I don't know. I think they say bad news gets more listeners or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I didn't really anticipate this being such a grim episode. But um, <laughs> with the municipal election, yeah. I mean, it's just, just this isn't really a story it's just something that piqued my interest this morning and it just we'll start off with an example and and go from there to the sort of broader point that i, I think is of interest uh and that's uh, a candidate in hamilton cameron kretsch who some may know um was involved in uh, various stories during the last few years at hamilton city hall was the chair of the lgbtq uh, Adv Citizen Advisory Committee uh, is now running for the second time in, I believe, Ward 2? Ward 2. But, yeah, okay. Um, and he just, just tweeted something this morning um, about a developer in the ward who had uh, approached him for a meeting, and he and he had that meeting. That's all good. And then ha the developer had made a, um, a donation to... to uh, Cameron's campaign for twelve hundred dollars, which is, I believe, still the maximum amount, um, which he re returned, sort of um, saying, you know, sorry, I can't accept donations from a developer. Now, as you point out, it will have been a personal check, not a corporate check, um, so nothing illegal. This is all completely by the book, completely allowed. Um, but yeah, the first part of this is it illustrates how, you know, if anybody's donating twelve hundred dollars in a campaign. Well, okay. Either a candidate or a, or a developer, in all likelihood. But we know, but we also need to point out that this developer is has a has a purpose or or, or a motive towards this. There's a, a sign that's gone up uh, at I believe one twenty four Wall Street. No, uh, yeah. Well, I, I want to at a site in uh, in Hamilton, one twenty four Wall Street South. Um, uh, basically, to you know, to say that they want they want to develop it, um, and there's a poem on the sign. I'm not going to read it, but it's a, uh, you know, to basically they're anti-homeless, you know, they, they don't, they don't want the, the houseless uh, on the site and, and one, and I kind of, that might be a different argument, but the, the point is that it's clearly that this person, I don't want to say they were trying to bribe Cameron, but they were definitely trying to, I don't know why else you would you would get you would meet with them and then hand over a check to a candidate. Well, yeah, I, 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 you made the point before we came on the air, and I'll reiterate it and pretend it's my point, <laughs> which is nobody donates anything, certainly not twelve hundred dollars, without you know. There's oh, no I... such thing as as a as a completely 
free donation of twelve hundred dollars. No, we just like you. No, I'm. Oh, and and, and we should also point. Says, we should also add in that this person in question is now registered as a third party advertiser in the in the municipal election, yeah. um, and is actively promoting another uh, another candidate, um, who I'm going to presume got that twelve hundred dollars. But I mean that that's. We don't know. I mean, we don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I, that's me entirely uh, hype, know, hype, hype, hyper. Uh, 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 assuming, and I have no evidence to yeah. back it up. And, so and Cameron said he wasn't even sure that the candidate that they're now supporting was aware of the fact that they were being supported. Fair um, enough. I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. It's it's more the general principle of the thing here that yes. I think is of interest, which is that um, you know the idea that corporate donations were banned when corporate donations were banned is completely false. Corporate donations are alive and well. They're just written on personal checks, um, and and uh, you know any candidate who's getting a twelve hundred dollar donation from someone is if it's not a family member, if it's not the candidate themselves, it's probably someone with significant business interests who's who's behind that donation, uh, and they're you know they're wanting something in return. That, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, as overt as a quid pro quo that anybody openly discusses, but the donations were always, you know, why did Pfizer, picking at random, donate huge amounts of money to the Liberals and to to all the parties? Because um, they know, want because access. Like that, that, it, 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 well, I mean, the, the, you heard what when the Liberals changed the laws, there's the, the pay for access scandal. Ooh, such a scandal. And I think the, the reason why the Liberals were so, uh, like Kathleen Wynne, I think, was caught Un, like just kind of shocked by the by it as a scandal is that it, it i know honestly it wasn't really a scandal like every party did it that's the thing like you you do not give money you don't give money to a candidate or to a can to a party or to a campaign um out of the goodness of your heart i'm sorry it just does not have like the ones who do give for the good they say, i really like you i like you roland i want you you and pat in the office i'm gonna cut you a check at best it's a hundred bucks if I walk up to you and I'm like, do you want a, do you want a 1200 or a, a 1500, whatever the maximum limit is now, do you want the, the top donation rolling? Okay. But I want your number. I want, I want to, I, I, when I come calling at your office, you take time to listen to what I have to say. That's what yeah. that's about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I can remember somewhere, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, this cash for access. It's like, of course it's cash for access. That's, that's the whole point. You, yeah. You have, you have a, get together at, at a fancy house or a fancy location you you have a couple of glasses of wine you eat some cold cuts and um and and you, and you pay twelve hundred dollars to meet the minister for five minutes shake the hand and well, and say hey don't forget me um, remember, remember two elections ago you had uh doug ford caught on camera meeting literally meeting with the heads of madame and green park and all the developers and he was caught on camera in a fundraiser saying yeah, I'll I'll tear up the green belt for you guys. He got caught. Oh no, I'll I'll not do that. And you know he still won the election. But it's, it's just well, and, that's and, that's and what how that's how the, our elections work. And ironically, at the time, the the way the, the the liberals were interpreting the law that they brought in was that um, f politicians could not be present at fundraisers at all. Um, so which makes fundraisers very difficult because like who the hell wants to go to a fundraiser with a bunch of volunteers well let me tell you nobody <laughs> even <laughs> the volunteers don't want to go um uh, you know and, and what the upshot of all this is is that you know i'm not saying that we should go back to corporate donations but at least under the old system a, a journalist could go and look at the donation records and say, okay, Pfizer donated this much to this party and this much to this party. Matami donated this much to this party. Uh, he donated to this this riding and this riding and this candidate and this leadership thing. Now it's guesswork because the donation, you know, the, the secretary of uh, or the PA of the CEO of such and such is makes a donation for $1,200. Well, that's awfully coincidence, coincidental, isn't it? But you know how you know, <laughs> given the, the sort of parlous state of the the uh, journalism profession, no fault of the journalists, just the fact that there are no jobs for them anymore. How the hell is anybody going to sort of track their way through that and say, you know, why the hell is the 
personal assistant or the secretary or the wife or the grandmother or the 14 year old mm -hmm. son not 14 year old son but the 18 year old son of x donating the full amount to to um this party but it that's going on all the time and it's that that actually that when you, you know i've seen it with my own eyes and those things that does walk up against the line of illegality in my opinion um it's a great it's, it's a great you're not supposed to be able to if you're a corporation uh, or let's say a developer and you say, I want to donate, you know, you could go to a, can a candidate and say, well, I'll, I'll give you $20,000 for your campaign. Well, how do you do that? Well, I'll find 20 people that I can give $1,000 to each and they'll donate to your campaign. And I'll know that they did it because I'll be able to see at the end of the year, you know, the name, their names on the elections Ontario rolls. And here's the thing. There's no way of no, like that's, that's illegal. That's, illegal but there's no way of checking that because i'd have to go and say to uh you know i have to go to each one like did you know did roland Tan did roland tanner give you a thousand dollars to donate to this cause and you say nope and there's no way to prove it it's a it's a i think we saw uh was it the federal election or was it the provincial election there was a business where every single member of a board of directors made the maximum personal donation and and th everybody kind of smelled a rat it's like well you know try and be less blatant the, the fact is that usually people are less blatant than that um a, a, and most businesses don't want to max out the the amount but what that no, here, kind of thing is just going on it's completely routine but here's the thing is that you know we think we're trying to get account we think we're, it's accountable the other thing is this third party advertising you know that is to me that's more insidious than the, the trying to find your way around because you know in this case with camera crutch and it's not just camera crutch when we saw it in in burlington with marianne mead ward uh running and i'm sure we'll find it a few other examples as the uh, campaign goes on uh this time around but if i got a bone to pick with somebody and i got a deep pockets there's really nothing stopping me from saying i'm going to buy up every billboard or i'm going to mail out to every uh, uh you know every riding you know roland tanner is the worst thing to happen since sliced bread you know whatever whatever it is i keep picking on you rolling i don't mean to it's just <laughs> i'm serious you know, it's the first name that pops ahead but like you know say like camera uh you know candidate x is the worst you know the worst thing to happen to this city since you know uh you know ever and and you you, yeah. you pour deep you pour deep money into that and it's kind of like it, then and then you know in, in the case of marion Mead ward you know, when you say, well, who's who's paying for this? You look at who's registered as the third party and it's some numbered business account. Like it's not even like, oh, it's it's Joel McLeod is registered as the third party. It's all these numbered business accounts. Like it's it's a very it's very easy to set up a very shadow operation that in what 36, 35, 36 days um can completely tilt the course of a of an election. Yeah. Because there's no time to scrutinize. Yeah, you might find out afterwards, but what's the worst they do? Oh, they pay a fine. And and again, I mean, yeah, take it, taking that example. So 2018 was the first time third-party advertisers existed at a municipal level. Uh, and it was something that the that the liberals had introduced, and I don't know why. Um, it, you know, the it, again, who who realistically is going to spend the money on this kind of thing? Well, really, a municipal government. It's only going to be developers. You know, who are the people? Who are the people with the big financial interests at municipal levels of government? It's it's basically the developers, um, and they're the ones who certainly in two thousand eighteen were pouring money into third party advertising. Certainly, this one example in Hamilton, and it is just one example. Um, it's a developer who's registering as a third party advertiser, you know, um, and third party advertising at every level of government. Um, in my experience, is just universally negative garbage. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know there was kind of a fuss about changes to the law that the PCs had made, and actually it was one of the few places where I was like, I'm not sure I really disagree with this. I'm kind of on the PC side here in that the, the third-party advertising is nonsense. And sure, they were going after the, um, the union-backed um, family, what is it, the family... Working Families... Working Families group. Coalition. Yeah. Which is backed by the unions. And, and, you know, people felt that basically the PCs were going after them, and they probably were. Well, 
you know, the, the ads that the Working Families Coalition group run are a bu bunch of dishonest garbage. Um, it just happens, happens to be left-wing progressive dishonest garbage. Um, and it, it adds nothing particularly to... Uh, it, it, you know, uh, when the Liberals are at their peak, it meant that the Liberals didn't have to pay to run attack ads because the Working Families guys were doing it for them. You know, un uncoordinated and completely legally, I'm sure. Um, but, but that was just the fact of the matter. Um, we don't need it, you know, and if, 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 if parties want to run negative ads, they should at least have the, the, the wherewithal to put their own name on it. Um, so it, it adds nothing. Um, it, it, the only people at municipal level who are going to throw money around are 99 times out of 100 people who want to get a building built of one kind or another. Uh, and again, people have a right, you know, I'm not disputing people have a right to be a developer and a right to want things built um but the the, the you know the, the the fact that it's so one-sided in terms of the people who have the money and the desire to use that money to buy influence or put pressure on uh, politicians is, is is problematic and um it's not like you know that power dynamic doesn't color every single thing that happens at a municipal level one way or another it's almost as if you makes it would make sense to just get rid of advertising. Period. Like, get get out. I I'm gonna throw it there. Just get rid of it all. Even the can, the candidate ads. You know, forget the big going into the spectator and buying like a full page ad. You know, vote vote Joel for mayor or whoever. Like, ban it all. Ban it all. Ban the third party advertising. Ban the signs. Signs on lawns. Those are useless and uh, environmental waste. Ban it all. And. In the age of social media, it costs nothing to tweet out your policy statement or to put out your your thing up. You could raise money to pay for a website or maybe to to uh, uh, you know coordinate that or maybe to pay, to buy some flyers for your campaign. Well, better better than that. I mean, the the suggestion that that um, Dave Meslin had for this is you know the government knows our mailing addresses. Obviously, the government needs to know everybody's mailing address. We need to know where you live. For some reason, email is not considered part of that deal. It seems to me that every person in the province could easily have an official government-recognized email address. And then, come election time, every candidate gets the right to send... So Either the candidates individually or mm -hmm. collectively gets the right to send X number of emails to each person who's got the right to vote to provide actual information. Now, the other thing uh, Dave uh, uh, suggested was you know, basically like a booklet that would be de delivered to every house in the riding or municipality or the ward or whatever with a, a catalogue of the candidates running in that ward or that riding right. uh, with their vote for me. So rather than going through this kind of ridiculous... Um, well, contest for money, eh? Um, and, you know, who, who can knock on the most doors? And the thing is, you know, four years ago, it was starting to be a problem, the number of people who have um, those cameras on their doors. So the, one of the last ways in which politicians can actually talk to people and make any kind of impression was to knock on the door and catch someone at home. That's going now. Uh, soon we're all going to have cameras on their doors and no one's mm -hmm. going to be answering the door when they see politician standing there um so we need to have ways in which um candidates can communicate now and actually a huge kudos actually to to burlington and burlington council for voting and i can't remember the exact details um but there was something along these lines that they discussed and i believe passed um they also introduced um uh basically donation refunds to to encourage donations from individuals so the same as you get a refund at the provincial or federal level if you make a no donation you get 60 percent back or 70 percent back or whatever they they, they uh, made that commitment and i believe there was talk and I, I need to actually check this um that, that they were talking about that kind of uh, approach where information goes to every household rather yeah and, and that's makes all kinds of sense to do that both electronically and you know a small amount of paper like you know every candidate's going to be guaranteed to get their information into every house 
that's really all I ever wanted to do as a candidate was reach every person and give them the chance to see who I am uh, and what I'm but that's, all about. And that's what, you know, the, the, what we're talking about is some kind of very basic reforms to the system uh, that I, th I think you're right. I think would just neutralize the power of corporate money in, in our in our electoral system. And, you know, hey, we've both said that, you know, municipalities are kind of a great way to kind of test drive these things and see how they work. It's too late now for this election, obviously, but, you know, hopefully some uh, some municipalities run the 905, they'll have different, somewhat different makeups uh, if they are. And somebody might, hopefully, if you're listening, give this a shot at the next, uh, for, for your next uh, four year run. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I see that we're coming up on our on our time for this episode, so I think we're going to call it quits for this one. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. We'll talk with you again next Tuesday. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, wrong button. Hang on a sec. <laughs> <laughs>